everyone. Thank you for joining us for the NVMe OF 1.1 Specification Features and Use Cases webinar. We're just going to give it one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. everyone. Um, welcome again to the NVMe OF 1.1 Specification Features and Use Cases webcast hosted by the NVMe Express organization. We want to go ahead and present um, our presenters for this um, for today's webinar. So we have John F. Kim from Mellanox, um, Nishant Loda from Marvel, and then Sebastian Grandjean Paranoid Comtesse from NetApp. Um, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to John now, who's going to provide an NVMe OS overview. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. This is John from Mellanox, and I'm happy to talk about or kick off this webcast about NVMe over Fabrics 1.1. So first, a little background about why do we need NVMe over fabrics in the first place, and then that helps us understand what's caused the change, what's driven the changes that are in version 1.1. So initially, NVMe was available over PCIe connections, and it was very fast and very efficient. It still is, but it was pretty much limited to local use because of the scalability and reach limits of PCIe. So, but there's always been a desire to share network storage. If you look at back for the last uh, probably 30 years, whenever someone comes out with new or better storage, shortly afterward there was a push or a need or request from customers to share it across a network. This makes it easier to share the storage, both physically and logically. It's easier to provision and manage the storage because you can assign the right amount of storage to the right server and the correct application as it's needed instead of simply over-provisioning every, every server with lots of local storage. It makes life much more efficient if you're uh, supporting storage for cloud or virtualization or containers. Uh, it's simpler to migrate either the data or migrate a workload. And then it's also uh, easier to deploy data efficiency and data protection technologies. So whether you're using deduplication or compression or snapshots or replication, mirrors, clones, those are all typically easier to do when you have network storage than if you have to do it to the local storage of many different servers. So there is definitely a need from customers to keep using NVMe technology to keep the semantics, the low latency, the very efficient protocol, um, the ability to have multi-queue I.O., which is one of the big advantages of NVMe over other, uh, over other types of uh, flash storage. Uh, but they want to do it over a network and keep the NVMe semantics. So we see in this diagram, there's a move from local storage to network storage. But in the past, if you did this, you had NVMe drives in the server, and then you added on top of that another network protocol such as iSCSI or Fiber Channel or um, NFS or SMB or an object protocol. So you, were, you could network the NVMe storage, but you're losing some of the efficiency because you're no longer using the NVMe protocol. Therefore, seeing the need for this, the NVMe Express organization came up with the NVMe Fabrics release uh, standard. And we can see that the, from this timeline that the first NVMe standard was in 2011. But then the first NVMe over Fabrics standard, NVMe OF, came out in 2016. So we can see there's been a progression of standards with new features being added to the NVM Express standard. And as, but the NVMe over Fabrics was for a long time, uh, from 2016 until 2018, still on the first release. Uh, there were some enhancements. So uh, first, the NVMe over Fabrics first came out supporting RDMA. Uh, and then a year later, they added support for Fiber Channel over, or sorry, for uh, NVMe over Fiber Channel, or FC NVMe. That was with version 1.0a, about a year after the initial release. And then a year after that, support was added for NVMe over TCP. And uh, Vinod is going to talk uh, more about that 
in just a minute. Uh, sorry, Nishant is going to talk about that in just a minute. So more, much more recently, just toward the end of last year, NVMe over Fabrics 1.1 came out uh, and that's uh, in October and right after NVMe over NVMe Express version 1.4 and we're going to talk more about that today. So let's go forward. This is the official timeline and roadmap from the NVMe Express organization. So it sort of summarizes in visual form what I just talked about. You can see the evolution of three different standards in parallel, the NVMe, NVMe over fabrics, and NVMe MI or management interface specifications. All right. And I think that's just a good summary, so I won't dwell on this slide. But let's go on and talk about what's actually in NVMe over fabrics 1.1. So the first and probably most exciting, and, and again, the shot's going to talk more about this, is the ability to run transport over TCP. Again, previously it had to be RDMA or then fiber channel, but you had to have, uh, well, well, let me talk more about that in the next slide, but you had to have some kind of special transport, and now you can run it over TCP. So that's very exciting for a lot of people. The next are a series of multipathing improvements. So this specifically includes asymmetric namespace access, as well as a domains and divisions uh, uh, domains, the ability to separate the storage into domains and divisions for easier maintenance and upgrades. I'll talk more about that in just a second. And then there were a category of improvements in the new specification in the discovery and transport area. So now you can have a persistent discovery controller. You can have a fine-grained fabric IOQ deletion. And I'll explain exactly what that means. And now you also have the end-to-end -end flow control has been made optional. And I'll talk about why that happened as well. So let's go forward and dive into this before we get into uh, a more detailed coverage of NVMe over TCP and then, then, and then into a use case, a real world use case of how you can use the new features in NVMe over Fabrics 1.1. So in brief, why, did, why was there a need to run NVMe over TCP? You already had the ability to run it on RDMA over two different kinds of fabrics as well as on fiber channel, which is of course remains very popular for enterprise storage. But why add another protocol? And the, an the simple answer is that not all customers could use PCIe or RDMA or fiber channel. Uh, PCIe has, as mentioned before, some limitations on distance and scale. And while it's very fast and very low latency and it's not very expensive, PCIe is not really designed to be a scale-out fabric. It's really been designed to connect one or maybe two or possibly four CPUs to a bunch of peripherals. Uh, and it definitely has some limitations if you're saying I want uh, highly available, redundant, and resilient scale-out fabric that can reach across multiple servers. It can be done, it has been done, but it's not easy and it's uh, not necessarily straightforward. The second is that RDMA solutions, which are typically running on InfiniBand or Rocky or iWarp, uh, require special hardware. There are soft or software-only versions of uh, some of these for Rocky and iWarp, but effectively the way everyone does it is if you're going to use one of these, you have special adapters and possibly special switches in order to support this and get really good performance. So if you have a server which does not have the right adapters, then you really can't do RDMA or can't do it very well from those servers. And finally, Fiber Channel, of course, requires its own dedicated Fiber Channel Network or FC SAN. If you have one, it's great, very easy. You can add the NVMe over Fabrics on top of your existing Fiber Channel SAN. But if you don't have one, you know, it can, it's a, considered a big effort to build one if you don't already have a Fiber Channel infrastructure in place. TCP, on the other hand, is ubiquitous. Everybody has it. Uh, it's the transport of choice for many data centers, especially in the cloud. It doesn't require any special networks or hardware. Uh, it runs on all the network adapters and all the switches. It's scalable um, and it, support, it can run over long distances. Uh, and with the proper hardware and proper configuration, TCP can provide very fast performance and quite low latency. Nishant will again show you more details on that. But before that, let me talk about the multipathing improvements I mentioned. So, so first of all, and by the way, there's a typo here. It says, and it should say NVMe 1.1 added a specification for multipathing. So NVMe 1.0, single path. You assume just one path from the controller to the storage or from the host through the controller. With NVMe 1.1, we added the multipath capability. 
but it assumed that all the paths and controllers were identical, meaning that every, every path had the same performance, the same latency, and it either was working or not. So um, there wasn't really a way to discriminate and say, I prefer, I have two paths to the storage from my host, but one is faster than the other, one is preferred, and the other is the redundancy or failover path. Uh, in the 1.1 spec, you can multipath, but you just have to assume they're identical, controllers are identical, the same amount of storage, same latency cost, etc. So changed in NVMe 1.4 is asymmetric namespace access. And this feat support has now been added to NVMe over Fabrics 1.1. What does that mean? It's a kind of a long name there, asymmetric namespace access. So it means that with a namespace, uh, which is typical, a typical way to define a set of storage in NVMe and NVMe over Fabrics, I can now have multipath access, but it does not have, the paths don't have to be identical. I could have one path is clearly preferred, and the second is the, and the second, I could have a primary and secondary path. I could uh, tell the controllers or tell the host that one path has a lower latency than the other. Uh, and the controllers might control, have primary access to different amounts of storage, and that's very common with a, a, a NUMA setup or a two controller storage array, that one controller might have faster access to storage set A and slower access to storage set B and the opposite for the other controller, which is the primary controller for storage set B, but the backup controller for storage set A. So you can now have a preference. You can not only have multipathing, but a preference for that multipathing or, the multi or uh, multipathing to the storage. So it gives you more flexibility and resiliency and better control over the situation. Now let's talk about the domains and divisions. So again, originally with NVMe, uh, you had one subsystem. So the whole, <coughs> excuse me, the whole NVMe system was one unit. If you had a problem and you had to restart it or uh, reestablish the connection, you had to reboot the whole thing. You managed the whole thing as one monolithic uh, pile of storage. And uh, that's fine, except that it's very common when you have a large storage array that maybe only part of it needed to be taken down for maintenance. Or you might have need to reboot or rebuild or migrate just a portion of it, and you didn't want to take down the entire thing. So now you can divide your NVMe over fabric storage into different into domains and divisions, and you can power them up and down, manage them, or have faults and fault recovery separately for each domain and division. So this is really good if you have a large NVMe or NVMe over fabric subsystem, and it helps improve non-disruptive operation. All right, so that's what we have for the uh, multipathing category. Now let me talk about what, what we proved in discovery and transport for NVMe over Fabrics 1.1. So first we have persistent controller discovery. So in NVMe, the first NVMe over Fabrics, of course, a controller could go out there and discover uh, storage. I'm sorry, the host could go out and discover the controller with its storage, but that's a one-time deal. You discover it, and then if it changes, if it goes, if it has a problem, you have to go out and do the discovery all over again. You have to, I think, kill the connection and then reestablish it and do a new discovery. Now, with NVMe over Fabrics 1.1, you can refresh or repeat the discovery. So if there's an update, a change, if that uh, storage system added more storage or new features, you can get, you can, the host can find out by uh, refreshing, keeping that connection and refreshing the discovery without having to go do a brand, uh, brand new connection and new discovery. The second improvement is you can delete individual I.O. queues without terminating the connection. So again, with NVMe over Fabrics 1.0, you really you had multiple I/O queues, but only one connection between the host and the controller. So if you had a problem, you would have to disconnect and wipe out all the queues. So let's say you had ten different data streams going or ten different threads in the application, each accessing a different amount of data, and one of those queues ran into a problem. If you wanted to reset it, you have to kill all ten processes or all ten threads, uh, sorry, all, th all ten queues, uh, and then restart them all. Now you can delete an individual queue, just the one that has the problem and all the others will keep running uninterrupted. And then there's a flow control update. So this is a little more subtle. So it turns out that there, was, there, were two, there are two queues in NVMe and NVMe over Fabrics, and they normally both offered flow control, but vendors and customers were not using flow control in the submission queue. Uh, and it turns out they most of the time they didn't need to, but technically they were violating the spec because the spec said you had to have flow control in both the queues, including the submission queue. Uh, but you, nobody was using it. So in NVMe over Fabrics 1.1, we make that submission queue flow control optional, which is fine because 
nobody was almost nobody was using it, and, and the reason they weren't is that the lower level protocols or transports beneath NV mover fabrics typically had their own flow control, which was doing the job. So again, this is sort of a, in this case the spec uh, and the other two other things I talked about. The spec adds new features and capabilities. In this case, it, uh, the spec is adjusted to a, to match more what people the actual implementations, in that people were generally not using submission queue flow control. All right, so I hope I haven't bored anyone too much with the technical nitty gritty there of what's new in the standard, but some of these features are pretty interesting. Now let's go into for a deeper dive into probably the most exciting and biggest part of NVMe over Fabrics 1.1, NVMe over TCP. So we have Nishant Loda of Marvell. Nishant, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, John. Uh, nice summary. I think uh, both the NVMe and VM Express group kind of has spent years and years, a broad consortium of companies developing both the NVM E standard as well as the NVMe or fabric standard. Uh, like John mentioned, both of these have kind of gone through significant uh, revisions, uh, making uh, NVMe and NVMe or fabrics kind of more enterprise class, more usable. And uh, within NVMe or fabrics 1.1 is a key new specification called NVMe or TCP. Uh, like John mentioned, uh, the way I like to always talk about NVMe or TCP is uh, it has all the tenets of simplicity, right? TCP being ubiquitous, uh, runs everywhere, runs everything on our internet. Uh, and uh, I believe that NVMe or TCP, for the reasons of simplicity and its ubiquitous nature, uh, uh, will be a strong contender for uh, the various options in NVMe or fabrics to help scale out NVMe all across the data center. So uh, what is this? What does it comprise of? Let's dive uh, uh, straight into it. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, within the NVMe or Fabrics 1.1 specification is NVMe over TCP. Uh, if you see the picture here on the right-hand side are the various different options to access NVMe. There is certainly PCI Express, uh, which is not scalable uh, beyond a couple of uh, uh, nodes, like John mentioned. And there are various different other fabrics. There is Fiber Channel with FC NVMe. There is RDMA, both Rocky, Rocky V2, as well as its TCP variant called iWarp. Uh, and while all of these standards, both Fiber Channel and RDMA, were done in the past, very recently is a new binding that has been defined as part of the 1.1 specification called NVMe or TCP. The key thing about NVMe or TCP, it is not Fiber Channel, it is not RDMA based. It is a simple Ethernet based TCP transport. Uh, and uh, the standard itself uh, was initially promoted by a lot of uh, kind of cloud uh, uh, tier one cloud guys like Facebook, Google, but many others, uh, broader um, you know infrastructure companies and networking companies, including Intel, Marvell, and others, have strongly kind of promoted NVMe or TCP for the reasons primarily of of simplicity of being able to use existing networks and existing uh, network interface cards that do not support. Uh, specialized protocols like RDMAs to still transact NVMe and access remote NVMe storage uh, uh, so that NVMe can be scaled out all across uh, uh, the data center. The thing about TCP is that uh, you know it is highly suited for large-scale deployments, longer distances. Uh, uh, TCP has been actively developed and has matured over multiple years. There are many new standards within the TCP uh, stack, a lot of uh, those have been implemented both by hardware NIC vendors as well as operating system uh, kernels. <clears throat> so let's uh, kind of double click on NVMe over TCP and understand how exactly NVMe over TCP uh, works, right? So if you're familiar with different NVMe transports, right? Uh, uh, at a high level, there is uh, PCIe, which is uh, has memory semantics, which means commands and responses and data used kind of shared memory model uh, to transact uh, uh, between the application and the NVMe controller or memory there. Uh, then uh, extension of the memory based uh, uh, you know model is uh, RDMA, which can use either message or memory, uh, where commands and capsules can use kind of shared memory. Uh, to transact uh, um, 
But there are similarities between uh, TCP and fiber channel uh, from an NVMe or fabrics perspective. Both TCP and fiber channel uh, use kind of a message-based constructs, uh, <clears throat> right, where uh, you know, uh, data payloads are encapsulated uh, as messages and then uh, sent across the wire. <laughs> Uh, so once again, uh, kind of in a nutshell, uh, NVMe or TCP uh, is an architecture that allows you to use existing network interface cards to transact NVMe or fabrics. Uh, um, if you're familiar with NVMe queue pairs, there is a submission queue and there is a completion queue. Each of those queue pairs are mapped to a TCP connection, and then TCP then uh, underlying provides a reliable transport model, which means that uh, all the things that TCP brings in, whether it's congestion control, whether it's reliable communication, all of that is then handled by the underlying TCP IP stack. Um, um, as everybody understands with TCP, because of things that are inherent to TCP, a lossless Ethernet fabric is not required uh, in com comparing and contrasting to uh, some RDMA protocols that uh, might require a lossless Ethernet fabric. So uh, let's now talk about some use cases for NVMe or TCP, and kind of broadly, I break up these use cases into two different parts uh, here. A lot of you guys are familiar with a traditional uh, SCSI-based protocol called iSCSI, right? iSCSI was prevalent uh, in a lot of data centers to allow to use a simple TCP-based, uh, TCP-IP-based transport to access remote SCSI devices, right? Think of NVMe or TCP as a natural extension from iSCSI, but for NVMe. So NVMe TCP defines an excellent alternative for customers who have deployed iSCSI and in their journey to NVMe will eventually adopt uh, uh, NVMe over TCP. So one typical use case uh, uh, is um, uh, kind of a more initiator target uh, kind of use case uh, where there is a bunch of servers uh, which access remote storage. Uh, could be an all-flash NVMe-based storage that is accessed using NVMe or fabrics. Uh, if you are familiar with the iSCSI world of uh, uh, things, it was often that the storage array or the all-flash array used some kind of iSCSI offload in order to preserve CPU cycles and deliver higher performance on that all-flash array. At least uh, my view is that you would see uh, you know, similar offloaded mechanisms for even NVMe or TCP starting off uh, uh, within the all-flash array. Uh, initiators or servers which need to access remote storage uh, could use a simple software-based uh, uh, you know, NVMe or TCP uh, module that would help them connect to this all-flash array using NVMe or TCP and also so eventually, I expect that there will be offloaded NVMe or TCP options that uh, would be available using specialized uh, NIC cards uh, uh, that would deliver uh, you know, uh, better performance and lower latency for the customers who are looking to get that extra bang for their buck. Uh, one other use case is uh, a classic uh, EBOF or Ethernet connected bunch of uh, flash use case uh, uh, for hyperconverged infrastructure. If a lot of you guys are familiar with HCI, you know it is a, a bunch of servers, each of them with their own local storage that are clustered together, typically over a high-speed Ethernet network. Now, one of the big challenges with hyperconverged infrastructures has been that if customers want to scale out. Uh, a storage, they need to add another compute node. So uh, storage and compute basically scaled out linearly, and with the customers did not need compute, they were forced to add more compute in order to get to more storage or higher capacity storage. Uh, the concept of EBOF uh, comes in and helps resolve one of those uh, issues where you could have uh, NVMe or TCP connected EBOF uh, hooked up to a hyperconverged infrastructure node that will allow you to add more storage to a HCI infrastructure without necessarily having to scale uh, on the compute resources. Uh, and so this allows you know, hyperconverged infrastructures to grow their storage uh, uh, without requiring investments that are not absolutely essentially required. Uh, and with NVMe or TCP, you know, using uh, uh, software initiators, uh, any network interface card within a hyperconverged infrastructure could essentially talk to uh, an Ethernet-connected bunch of flags and, and gain exactly that uh, uh, storage scalability. Um, um, 
I understand uh, talking to a lot of customers uh, as well as just past history that uh, there is no uh, flip of the button where customers would move from traditional protocols like iSCSI to uh, NVMe over TCP. Um, there will be some, uh, there will be a migration path. Uh, so it is expected that uh, network interface cards as well as storage arrays would provide uh, you know, <clears throat> um, concurrent access, uh, both for legacy protocols uh, as well, uh, like iSCSI, as well as concurrently with NVMe or TCP, making migrations seamless and simple and not creating kind of islands within the data center that uh, uh, nobody likes. Um, uh, moving on, um, here I wanted to go a little bit further deep into uh, a typical NVMe or TCP uh, architecture here. Uh, on the left-hand side, we show a host, uh, which you could consider as a server. Some people call it also as an initiator. And here on the right-hand side, we showcase a target. Right? Uh, so and before we talk a, uh, a little bit more detail about this, one of the important things to understand is that uh, you know, in order to get NVMe or TCP right, in order to make it efficient, in order for you to uh, kind of uh, deploy an infrastructure that allows best utilization of investment in NVMe or flash storage, uh, the network, which is both the switching as well as the NICs that comprise your NVMe or TCP infrastructure, uh, need to be optimized, right? Otherwise, your mileage could vary. And with that context in background, let's look at this. Uh, uh, stack here. Uh, it's a typical stack here on the left hand side, which is the initiator. There is uh, the NVMe uh, layer with its uh, uh, send and completion queues, and below that is NVMe or TCP layer, uh, which is where the NVMe TCP kind of PDU headers get uh, uh, created. There could be a PDU payload or more uh, in capsule data, which is uh, then all uh, um, then goes into the NVMe or TCP layer. Uh, the PDU header is attached and then it goes through the TCPIP stack uh, where TCP IP headers are attached and TCP payloads are created, all your segmentation, header processing, which then eventually goes to a network NIC. Right? Uh, this is a view of a non-offloaded NVMe or TCP architecture. Basically, you use the kernel stack and the kernel TCP IP stack to process TCP payloads. If you com compare and contrast that with our target side infrastructure here, which uh, is depicted with using an offload mechanism, is that uh, you have, will have the ability uh, to have uh, the entire NVMe or TCP um, kind of protocol offloaded to a specialized NIC device. Uh, what is the value of that? What exactly that uh, would happen? I'll talk to you in terms of uh, some performance metrics uh, uh, that Marvell has measured internally in the next few slides. Um, okay. <clears throat> so uh, one of the key things that uh, people talk about uh, for NVMe or TCP, or in general for NVMe and NVMe or fabrics, is latency, right? Uh, um, memory, flash, extremely low latency, and uh, a lot of conversations happen around kind of what is the access latencies to uh, NVMe using NVMe or fabrics. Also, uh, there is conversations about uh, you know average latency, but uh, here I would like to provide a little bit more perspective that there are applications uh, that access remote storage, right? Uh, and when you access remote storage from an application in order to serve ultimate customer IOs, uh, it is important to have consistent latency. You know, average latency could mean that 80% of your IOs may be completing in, let's say, 100 microseconds, and the other 20% might be taking 200 microseconds to complete, right? Uh, while the average still comes out to be uh, a good enough number, but applications expect, expect consistent response time from their underlying infrastructure, their average latencies by themselves just do not cut it. So hence, there is a kind of concept within, within people who characterize NVMe or fabrics economy concept of tail latency. And if you look at the chart here on the right-hand side, I have compared three different uh, NVMe or uh, fabrics uh, uh, for their simple ping pong latency for four kilobyte read operations. Um, and my apologies if the chart is uh, too small to read, at least it is for me. Um, 
So the three lines, the gray line here is uh, NVMe over RDMA, which as you can see provides the absolute lowest latency uh, here. And uh, if you see the last 20% of the IOs, uh, their completion times or their latency is not very different from the rest of the IOs, which means the tail latency is relatively low. If you look at the light blue line at the very top, which is using software, which means you use a, a kernel-based TCP/IP stack to do NVMe over TCP, uh, not only are the average latencies high, which uh, could be acceptable in different scenarios, uh, but the, the somewhat troublesome part of that uh, is the tail latency, which is the last 20% of the IOs take literally 2x to 3x more time to complete, which a lot of applications uh, like database uh, you know, things like that uh, cannot tolerate uh, uh, having inconsistent latencies between a large percentage of their total IOs that they put out uh, uh, on the wire. And here is, in the middle is, uh, you know, that dark blue line where uh, uh, we use offloaded NVMe or TCP, which is basically utilizing a TCP offload engine which resides within a NIC uh, to help offload the server of TCP IP. Right, of TCP IP processing, uh, as well as some uh, NVMe over TCP processing. Uh, what that allows you to do is it allows you to bring your average latency down. It's uh, like we said earlier, it, RDMA will deliver the absolute lowest latency. Uh, but if you offload NVMe over TCP, uh, the latencies will be higher than that of RDMA. Uh, but much better than that of using a general purpose kernel based operating system based uh, uh, NVMe or uh, kernel op operating system based TCP stack. Uh, beyond average latencies, also take a look at uh, the tail latencies here for the dark blue line. Uh, they are higher than that of RDMA, but the curve is much flatter as compared to using a kernel-based TCP IP stack. So <clears throat> a couple of perspectives here just to kind of reiterate a couple of things. First, whenever you are characterizing or looking at NVMe over fabrics, any NVMe over fabrics, uh, just do not go by average latencies because average can be a misnomer. There can be a large percentage of IOs that take extraordinarily long time to complete, which applications just cannot tolerate. Right. Uh, <clears throat> number two, uh, it is important to look at what other kind of special options you have in terms of optimizing your network, uh, optimizing your uh, network interface cards, uh, which can potentially have a specialized TCP offload engine to take some of that processing out. Right. So as um, we are familiar with the world of uh, you know RDMA or offloaded iSCSI, uh, what the offloading does is you are seeing here in terms of reduced uh, you know end to end latency but there is also another perspective of that that i would like to put out and uh, uh, which is what is the cost of io in terms of cpu cycles and kind of this is the same extension of data uh, using the setup uh, described in the previous uh, uh, slide um, uh, here again if you look at the chart here uh, on the very left-hand side is an uh, initiator, which is then connected using a fabric to a uh, uh, NVMe-based uh, you know, all-flash array. What you see here is that uh, uh, the three different bars indicate what is the maximum IOPS performance of a 25-gig NIC um, when transacting different types of NVMe over fabrics. Uh, uh, you see on the left-hand side from an initiator perspective uh, that uh, <coughs> both uh, Rocky and offloaded NVMe or TCP deliver very similar performance, although CPU utilization uh, on the server when transacting NVMe or TCP, even with offload, is higher, right? Uh, RDMA is an efficient memory-to-memory -memory transfer protocol, while the message semantics being used uh, uh, by NVMe or TCP does cost a little bit more uh, CPU, but compare and contrast that to the last kind of blue bar here, which is software NVMe or TCP, if you go through the general purpose kernel TCP IP stack, the full performance of that NVMe drive cannot be achieved. So there are these considerations that um, end customers need to understand when deploying NVMe or TCP. NVMe or TCP is simple, it's straightforward, it's ubiquitous, it can scale to large-scale deployments, but your value and your mileage can vary depending upon what kind of uh, interface cards you use, what kind of network you have. Uh, it is not good for everything, right? If you are delivered, if you are expecting the absolute lowest latency, RDMA is a great choice. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> if you can tolerate a slightly higher latency and uh, uh, offloaded NVMe or TCP is a great choice. And you can mix and match that with some, you know, uh, software NVMe or TCP uh, to still have every single server kind of access uh, uh, this uh, uh, shared uh, all flash array which has NVMe in it. And so with that, uh, I would like to pass it over to uh, Sebastian from NetApp. And I think uh, what Sebastian plans to do is kind of take both uh, all the information that me and John kind of talked about, both from our Fabrics 1.1 specification as well as NVMe or TCP, and say how uh, he's building some of these things into a classic use case from NetApp and its partners. Uh, over to you, Sebastian. Hello, everybody. This is Sebastian from NetApp, and thank you, John and Nisham. Uh, John explained about his history or of NVMe and NVMe over fabrics, uh, how it evolved and how it has been extended to incorporate new business demands. Nishan explained about how new business demands in particular, um, the demand for NVMe over fabrics uh, to use the popular TCP transport layer. I like to talk about Next Data. Next Data is an acronym for memory acceleration. It does not uh, it is not a product or a SKU you can order, but it is a solution you have to assemble. Uh, Next Data uses NVMe over fabric as a cornerstone to achieve fast response times and low latency for applications using memory by using memory tiering. Okay, on this uh, slide, you see a picture of uh, several different kind of storage media and their respective indicational response times. Uh, the NVMe consortium started out to address the, the need for low latency by constructing new ways to reduce latency in storage access. And this was very basic in the beginning. Over time, new requirements were implemented and NVMe over fabrics evolved, closing the immense gap between all flash SSDs and persistent memory. The gap between persistent memory and NVMe over fabrics is still tenfold, but it is much faster than normal SSD or HDD for that matter. On this slide, you see uh, two kinds of persistent memory. NVDIM, NVDIM and Intel Octane DC persistent memory. Intel Octane DC persistent memory is a bit more economical and is used by Max Data. On this slide, you can see where this persistent memory can be used. Uh, persistent memory sits between DRAM and storage. It's much faster and has lower latency compared to a flash drive. Persistent memory is a bit slower than DRAM, but the high, high latency, higher latency is only by a fraction. Compared to DRAM, persistent memory is more economical. The nice thing of Intel Optane DC persistent memory is that it is persistent, like a drive, but it is also bytes addressable like DRAM. What Max Data uh, combines storage and persistent memory. It provides a transparent memory and storage tiered file system for applications. No application rewrite is necessary. Best use case is for low latency demanding business applications or other workloads that will benefit from low latency like AI or analytics. You can start by experimenting with this solution by simply adding persistent memory to the host and install the host software. This involves not a big investment nor a big project. When active workload fits into the persistent memory tier, performance and latency is very good. The size of the memory tier can be much smaller as you only store a subset of the complete application footprint. When data needs to be written to storage or read from storage, latency and performance might suffer depending on what kind of storage tier you have. 
This is where NVMe overfabric comes into play, as it lowers latency to the storage tier and makes response times better. This solution is perfect, perfectly functional, as you see on the slide, but the early version of NVMe lacked enterprise-grade uh, and, and non-disruptive op operation features. So in practice it will work, but no enterprise would put their most critical applications on this architecture. Local drives for business-critical workloads is not a great idea if something happens to the host. On this slide you see the same solution, but with external storage that has capabilities and enterprise-grade features like data protection and multipathing. In this way, if something happens to the host, the data is separated from the host and it won't get lost. Multipathing in NVMe over Fabrics 1.1 will add redundancy and failover capabilities to the external storage and make much more optimized and is much more optimized for non-disruptive operations, which will make sure access to the storage will be available at all times. The previous versions of NVMe over fabrics didn't have these enterprise-grade redundancies and failover features, which made it more suitable for test or development environments maybe even data warehouse or reporting environments, but not for business critical application. That must be available all the time. With the new additions of transport layer, TCP, and multipathing over fabrics, uh, NVMe over fabrics 1.1 has become much more mature, has the same capabilities as other enterprise grade protocols. The same features but with much lower latency, which opens new possibilities for demanding applications. In the thrive to lower latency much more, use cases will incorporate the possibilities of NVMe over fabrics. This is one use case that leverage NVMe over fabrics in lowering latency with economics in mind. Thank you for your attention. Megan, back to you. Great, thank you all. We're going to go ahead and dive right now into the Q&A session of this webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions into the chat box. The first question that we wanted to go over is, what is tail latency and why is it important for NVMe and NVMe over fabric? Uh, sure, I can, this is Nishant, I can take that. Uh, I think um, we spoke about that a little bit uh, in the presentation, right? Uh, perhaps to kind of uh, Retrade here. Uh, a lot of a uh, lot of people look at latency as an absolute metric uh, in terms of uh, a only looking at fabric latencies, uh, right? While it is important to understand that uh, there is a stack on both sides as well as there is applications and actual media that can contribute to a total end-to-end -end latency. So when you look at latency, please look at uh, you know both. Uh, not just the fabric latency, but also the entire latency, including storage services that might be deployed uh, on a potential enterprise storage network. Um, right. uh, second thing uh, about tail latency is that uh, uh, there are applications that are very sensitive to I.O., and you cannot deploy or should not deploy an application uh, in, uh, with, uh, attached to some kind of storage in which uh, some IOs uh, uh, take, uh, let's say, uh, 10 microseconds to complete and some take 20 microseconds to complete. That'll just give unpredictable uh, you know, performance to the applications that perhaps sit over that database. So, and uh, if you use standard kind of uh, performance characterization tool in your labs or in your actual uh, deployments, a lot of those help you understand uh, uh, and plot latency across every single I.O. to help understand uh, uh, what your tail latency is. Uh, so please don't ignore that is my kind of recommendation. Great, thank you. The next question is, um, can each path be in a separate domain? Hi, this is John. Let me take that one. So uh, generally, no, and the reason is that uh, one domain can contain multiple namespaces. So since the paths go to a namespace, 
if you have, I'm assuming we're talking about multipathing. If you have a multipathing situation, the different paths would go to the same namespace, which is in one domain. So the uh, if anyway, so multipathing to one namespace would all those paths would be going to the same domain. However, you could have different paths to other namespaces going to other domains. Great, thank you. The next question is, does Windows 2019 support ANA over TCP, and does it support NVMe over TCP? Uh, Sebastian, did you, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, there is no, no support for, uh, for Windows directly. There are no Windows drivers for, t uh, for NVMe at all. Uh, the only thing you can do is maybe with a hypervisor or a host system that supports NVMe. So yeah, let me ask you about. Yes, go ahead. Uh, there's no, there's no Windows. There is Windows support for NVMe. There's no Windows support for NVMe over Fabric. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this is Nishant. I'll add to that that uh, it's specific to NVMe or TCP. Uh, if if you look at the latest Linux kernel, uh, starting with 5.0, uh, there is support for NVMe or TCP within uh, the Linux kernel. So it's a, it's a good place to kind of uh, get started with evaluating NVMe or TCP. Great. Is NVMe OS 1.1 specification ready from a data protection, redundancy, and management perspective? I can answer that. Um, redundancy is already incorporated in the 1.1, for example, by the um, the fact that it uh, has a ANA uh, multipathing. And uh, the data protection is something that uh, is done by the the array, the the storage array. But if the storage array um, uh, doesn't support non-disruptive operations because of the standard doesn't support it, then you cannot do any maintenance on the array. So the the data protection part is done, done by the storage array, the redundancy and the management perspective uh, is now in a separate uh, NVMe um, specification, but that will be incorporated into the whole uh, Thank you. The next question, do new versions of NVMe OS standard automatically support all features in new versions of the NVMe standard? The answer is mostly yes. In almost all cases, if you have a, a new version of uh, uh, NVMe over Fabrics, it does support all the new features that were also in the newer versions uh, up until that point of NVMe. Uh, there could be a case where some new NVMe feature requires a change to the NVMe over Fabrics protocol, but those are pretty rare. Most of the time, if a new feature is added to NVMe, support for that also carries into NVMe over Fabrics. Thank you. The next question, how does NVMe over TCP compare to NVMe over Fiber Channel in terms of CPU cycles and latency? <laughs> okay, that's Nishant. I'll take that. Uh, um, we did not have any data relating to FC and VME here. Uh, I'm happy to share that kind of directly uh, if you write me an email. Uh, but uh, um, at, at a very high level, without using any charts, uh, uh, we see FC and VME to deliver CPU efficiency as well as performance, very similar to that of kind of Ethernet-based uh, uh, RDMA stacks. So you can put that into perspective with some of my slides. Uh, I would say that uh, you know I think John mentioned this uh, in the past. Uh, uh, customers who have existing investments in fiber channel, who understand fiber channel stands, uh, right? For them, it's an easier upgrade path to FC and VME. It doesn't require different fiber channel HPAs. If you have a recent fiber channel HPA, a simple software update would make it capable of FC and VME, so, and that provides kind of an easy migration. Uh, a path, but if there are customers who do not understand fiber channel or do not understand uh, you know, a, a, a storage area network to build using fiber channel components, uh, uh, then you have a bunch of choices within Ethernet-based transports, be it RDMA or TCP. Thank you. The next question is for Sebastian. If Max data supports write, catching to PM or DRAM, 
How does um, it enforce data consistency in power in case of power failure? Yes, because it's persistent memory uh, and it's there. That's what the uh, the soft the software the host software that is installed that uh, makes sure that that is consistent. And that's why um, if you want to make a snapshot, uh, you need the host software in order to, for the whole operation or whole solution to work. Thank you. What does multipathing look like on NVMe over TCP? Sean, do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? Uh, John, let me get started and you can add. So uh, I think multipathing is uh, kind of a concept and a layer above the actual transport binding. So multipathing looks uh, exactly how it would on top of NVMe of FC NVMe or NVMe or RDMA or NVMe or TCP. Uh, thanks to the 1.1 spec, you have asymmetric namespace access. That means you can define, the system can define preferred parts, low parts, uh, you know, and uh, you have more intelligence within uh, within your uh, multipathing uh, software uh, uh, to help uh, bring out uh, that kind of accesses. Right, but it's agnostic to the tra transport underneath, generally speaking. Uh, you want to add to that, John? Yeah, I would agree with what Nishant said. From the NVMe standpoint, the multipathing can do what he said, and it, uh, it's agnostic to whether you use TCP fiber channel or RDMA. Uh, I would say that at, at a lower level, the multipathing could be set up different. You know, There's probably more than one way to set up the multipathing, uh, like at the layer 2 or at the at the protocol level. So uh, Fiber Channel could have one way of doing multipathing, TCP IP could have another, and RDMA could have another. Uh, and these methods are similar but not identical, but they would all support the NVMe multipathing above it. Yep. Thank you. Can you explain how NVMe over TCP handles network congestion? Uh, um, this is Nishant. I'll take a stab at uh, that. I think if, uh, it's not NVMe or TCP that handles network congestion. It's the TCP protocol that uh, would handle network congestion. So um, if you understand TCP and TCP congestion windows, uh, you know, end-to-end -end flow control is handled by the TCP IP uh, stack. There is NVMe level flow control, and that can be managed using uh, R2T uh, based credit mechanism. Also, there is some conversations about uh, seeing whether DCTCP or data center TCP uh, can be used uh, kind of for making NVMe or TCP kind of congestion uh, a little bit more efficient. Uh, we do believe that uh, definitely you know, DCTCP has a potential to kind of uh, estimate congestion in a TCP fabric a little better, but uh, its actual value is uh, yet to be proven. Thank you. The next question is for Sebastian. Is Max Data open source or only available from specific partners or integrators? Does it only work with Intel DCPMM? It's not open uh, source. It's a uh, licensed software from NetApp, and it doesn't only work with Intel uh, persistent memory. It also works with UM, and there are ways to emulate uh, a different kind of uh, memory models. So, so you can start experimenting before purchasing the actual persistent memory. Thank you. For ANA and multipathing, why can't we just assume both controllers are always identical? Right. This is John. So, assuming that both controllers are identical is kind of a simplistic model. And it's not, it's not that common in the real world. That assumes that each controller has the same power, the same amount of storage behind it, and identical paths to the different storage. Uh, what's much more realistic, while that can be the case, it's much more common and much more realistic to assume that each, the controllers might have different performance levels. They might have a different data path. Uh, the data paths have different latencies. Uh, and, you'd pr and there's a good chance you have a preference that uh, data paths from specific hosts to specific namespaces might prefer one controller over another. So that's the reality of how people usually like to set up their dual controller or multi-controller storage. So that's why the uh, NVM uh, 
NVMe 1.4 and NVMe over Fabrics 1.1 added support for the asymmetrical namespace access. Thank you. The next question, how is NVMe over TCP different from NVMe iWork? Both use TCP, don't they? You want to take that, Sebastian? Um, yes, sure. Um, NVMe uh, iWARP is a specific protocol that's optimized for long distances when optimizes their, the capacity of the TCP uh, environment is not uh, that optimal. And the other one, uh, Rocky is often called, is the uh, opposite side. That's the LAN optimized. I would add yeah. that. Uh, oh, go, go ahead, Michelle. Uh, please, John. I would add please. that. <laughs> I would add that uh, iWarp is a type of RDMA, and it usually requires a, an adapter, a special network, even at NIC, that has the uh, iWarp offloads. Where NVMe over TCP, it can use NICs with TCP offload, as uh, Nishant showed in his example, but it doesn't have to. Perfect, John. I was about to say exactly that. You know, uh, under, uh, underneath both of them, both iWARP as well as NVMe or TCP use TCP, but the semantics are different uh, with iWARP. There are RDMA semantics uh, uh, underneath uh, that, absolutely. And uh, the other thing is that although, to add to what John said, there are, you know, theoretically there are software implementations that could do iWARP on top of a regular NIC, but they are practically not possible while for NVMe or TCP and classic example is using Linux kernel 5.0, you could have a software uh, uh, NVMe or TCP initiator that could help you talk to a target, or you could use uh, offloaded NVMe or TCP NICs. Thank you. Has the NVMe Express organization considered adding parameters in the NVMe over TCP protocol to adjust windowing size for maximum throughput? This is Nishant. I, I'm not sure I get the question here itself. Uh, I, I, for, uh, I don't think, uh, at least as far as I am aware, that there is any work going on in the standardization process to allow for uh, you know, parameters to adjust windowing size for TCP. I think these parameters are agnostic, in my opinion, to the NVMe or Fabrics standard and more kind of specific to implementations uh, um, of the TCP stack, whether done in the kernel or in a specialized networking device. So to answer that, I don't think so. Great. Um, at this point, I don't think we have time to answer any additional questions. Um, but the, this webinar will be available on the NDM Express Bright Talk channel after this wraps up, and we will also be putting together a blog to answer any audience questions that we were not able to get to on this call. So thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you so much, and thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.